Hello, my name is Connor Kester. I am the Director of Family Outreach here at Victory Lutheran Church. Thank you so much for checking out our channel today. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss a video. Now on to our sermon. So when it comes down to 2023, last week we had uh, a good, great, I think, New Year's celebration, or at least pre-New Year's celebration, New Year's Eve. Uh, Sarah talked to you about you know, all those things that you desire of your heart, and then actually turning around and giving them back to God um, after you've received it. And today we're going to talk about the passage of time, because 2023 has turned into what? 2024. And for those of you, I don't know about you, some of you are very quick on how you sign things. You make that uh, very quickly, that, that adjustment. It takes me a long time to remember that it's 2024. Um, but it's a natural, beautiful gift that God has given us, the passage of time and a way to measure it um, year by year. Um, birthday by birthday, anniversary by anniversary, where you take a moment and typically reflect on one of those periods of time to look at the past, where you are in the present, and where do you want to go in the future? Or at least you wonder where you may be going in the future. And Psalm, and God reminds us to count our days. In Psalm 90, verse 12, he reminds us, Teach us to number our days, the psalmist writes, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Uh, the Living Bible says, teach us to number our days and to recognize how few they are. Help us to spend them as we should. Ephesians 5.15 also says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. The concept is pretty easy for us to understand that we do not have a limitless amount of time. You know, I heard somebody recently describe, uh, it's like we wake up in the morning and we have $1,440. And we spend every single dollar uh, until the day is over. And for those of you who are interested in those things, there's no way you would do that. Spend all your money every day, but that's what we do with our time. At the end of the day, we've got nothing. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. So far, I have spent every single minute and moment of my life. Yet nothing is guaranteed. And so you have to teach ourselves how to spend our time. I'm looking around, I look at our, our, our students in the back, and I'm like, they think oh, they got all the time in the world in front of them. And I'm like, I've got, I've got a couple of you left, all right, maybe, maybe. And so how we look at time is very precious and it's valuable. So it makes sense that we would get the most out of it that we can. And how do we spend our time? Now, there are some times we look at it and go, I'm just going to float along. Like I've got all the time in the world. And then we start misspending our time. There's a great quote that I love from one of my favorite movies. It's the Shawshank Redemption. And you know, some of you have been around here, you know this. It's a great movie, rated R, so just, but it's a great movie. And one of the best quotes in there is by the main character. His name is Andy Dufresne. And he's been in the jail now for 20 years, but he still dreams of the day that he is going to get out. And his friend comes up and says, you're talking nonsense. You're never going anywhere. You want to go to Mexico? Mexico's down there and you're here. And then he looks at him and he says, yeah, right, that's the way it is. It's down there and I'm in here. I guess it comes down to a simple choice, really. Get busy living or get busy dying. I love that quote. Because so often we think we're just staying status quo. We're just floating along. Well, if you're in that boat where you think you're just floating along, guess what you're doing? You're dying. It's living or dying. So we make choices to say, I want to 
live and how do we do that? How do we get busy living? Now, if you're a person who makes um, resolutions, uh, who you've thought about the next year, you have goals, you have plans, if you're that kind of person, uh, you're already thinking about what kind of adjustments that you need to make. You maybe need to make adjustments financially, you need to make adjustments physically, you need to make adjustments to this and to that. But the biggest adjustment that you have to make is to time. Like if you're going to wake up in the morning, if you're going to exercise, you need to find what? Time. If you're going to change even financially, you're going to have to figure out how to spend your time. It influences everything, right? It's really anything time. So how do you do and where do you start? And there's a wonderful passage uh, for Psalm 37, and I've adopted this personally for my theme verse for this year. From th- Psalm 37 is this, says this. God says, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. When we think about our resolutions, we think about our goals, we think about what we want to see happen, those come from where? They come from here as the desires of your heart. This is what I want to see happen. This is what I want life to be like. In Psalm 37, the psalmist writes, the first thing you should do is to take delight in the Lord. And when we take delight in the Lord, when we start to commune more with the Lord and spending time with the Lord, then his desires become your desires and back and forth. And the next thing you know, he has given you the desires of your heart. So of all the things that you're going to do and you're thinking about your health and you're thinking about what vacations you're going to take and where you're going to go and what you're going to do, the very first thing, Take delight in the Lord. And that's it. That's it. Take delight in the Lord, and he will then give you the desires of your heart. Prioritize your relationship with God. And that's it. Now, we just read a passage about people being invited to the wedding feast, talking about invited to heaven, but it's also into this communion of dining and eating with God. And what do they do? They give excuses. How often do we make excuses? I don't get up in the morning to exercise because I'm not a morning person, right? Or I've got something else to do. I don't do certain things because I have other commitments. I decide I'm not going to go to this place because I can't do. And we have all sorts of reasons of why not, that if you really took time to look at it, you could really punch a hole in every single one of those excuses. Now, if we just break it down into a single day, because God said, you know, your, your goals may be, look huge in a year from now, but he says, don't think about it in a year. Think about it in a day. What are you going to do today? Let's break it down simply today. Number your day, and how do you spend your time in the day? There are 1,440 minutes in a day. Now, you can imagine there's been all sorts of studies about it. There have been how do people spend their time And if you do a little quick Google search on it, I wish I could give you all sorts of cute facts about how people spend their time, but I'm not going to because there's just too much. But there's basic studies or this. It's like you have uh, how do people spend their time, and it goes like this in the United States. It kind of goes like this. You have all these different countries that are listed here, but you want to focus in on just the United States that people spend their minutes. You have 251 minutes spent on paid work. Now do the math there real quick. Divide that by 60. How many hours is that, Rose? By four hours. You get paid for eight, right? And uh, four hours a day, like, hmm, what's going on here? And, you know, I know some jobs where you're, and we don't spend all the time in work, 
It's relational, it's whatever is happening, but 251 minutes on that. And also understand that this takes into account uh, 15-year-olds who are starting their high school lives and also all the way through 64-year-olds. So if you're outside of that, it kind of skews everything, right? Because in terms of time. But the average American, 251 minutes are spent in paid work. 528 minutes sleep. That's over eight hours. I don't know who they're looking at, right? I don't know. That's not my life. But it's like over eight hours. Now, it's interesting uh, across the world. uh, China actually comes in at the number one for minutes in paid work and also number one in minutes sleeping. Uh, Not a lot else, but those two things. So then also you have, but then you have 122 minutes, two hours, a little bit, two hours and change for taking care of the house, grocery shopping, that kind of thing. 57 minutes in personal care. Again, this is men and women put together on this, but variety of people have spent every time 57 minutes in personal care, about an hour in personal care. 63 minutes eating. That's the lowest of all the countries listed here. That's the lowest amount of time spent eating. And that's an important fact, and we'll get to that in just a second. 148 minutes spending time on TV and radio. Now, this study was done like in two years ago. So what they call radio, I don't know. Because radio, listening to music, or whatever app, Spotify, whatever it may be. Uh, but TV, radio, Netflix, all the things, 148 minutes. And that's the highest of all the countries of brain dead time, you might call, right? 48, 44 minutes each day seeing friends. That's tied for the second lowest of every country. Uh, also important, I think, and we'll talk about that in a second when we talk about eating. 100 minutes doing other leisure, and then 31 minutes at least for education in school and study. And it's not talking about you guys as students. Part of your job is paid work, is doing your work. 31 minutes is just simply, I look at it as like improving yourself, doing education, those kinds of things. Now, what we don't have in, on here is how much uh, I left in my office how much time do you spend on, thank you, Benita, how much time do you spend on one of these things? Because this is also a place that we do work. This is a place that we do leisure. This is a place that we do a lot of these things that we just talked about, including wasting time. And I can't tell you what you do, and I'm sure there are studies on phone usage, but what you can do on your own is just open up an app, every app, Android, Apple, whatever it is, every phone you have, has some kind of app that tracks what do you do on your phone? How much time do you spend on Instagram? I know Apple does that. What time do you, Instagram, what time do you spend on this? What time do you spend on Netflix? What time do you spend on uh, Facebook? What time do you spend on answering emails? It, it, it shares all that kind of information. And I know Benita's like, are you feeling like anxious right now? Like, I've got this if I just ah, threw it. So. I know. But all these things, like, you know, I know, uh, and my own kids, if you take their phone, man, that's the best punishment of all time. I've never seen anybody have, like, apocalyptic meltdown in their brain is when you take their phone. Uh, and it's just what it is, by the way. Just, like, you all have those things when you're growing up. It's not like all oh, kids today. No, they all have different things. You do so much on it. Uh, and mine, if you have a smart watch, They even track how much you actually sleep. It actually tracks how well you sleep. It tracks all these different things. But I'm curious to say, hmm, what does it reveal? What would it reveal? And I've got nothing for you. That's for you to figure out. Figure out. If you're a person who's on there all the time, figure it out and just start looking at your own time study about how you spend your time. Now, again, I said our highest rating in our highest amount of minutes in worldwide is TV and radio in comparison to other countries. Uh, 
which is interesting because there's no TV and radio, if it's just TV, movies, whatever, you have no interaction with the people around you. You may be sitting on the same couch, you may be laughing at the same thing, but you're not engaging other people. Our lowest amount of time is eating, and the second lowest is spending time with friends. If, hmm? You can eat while you're watching a movie. Yes, you can do all that stuff. So it depends on what your household looks like. <laughs> but think about what we just read from the book of Luke when we're invited to what? To a banquet, which is a meal, which is enjoying people's time around a meal. And how often in the New Testament does Jesus, at the end of Revelation, we know in the book of Revelation, he, he compares, he says, I'm knocking on the door, and if you open the door to me, I'm going to come in and eat with you. I'm going to sit down and eat. When we talk about prioritizing your relationship with God, it's a communal effect of sitting down and eating. And we're the worst country at doing that. Of sitting down and eating with someone. And Jesus compares us to this time of communing with him. And so we should be spending time in prioritizing that. Not just checking off the list, that this is what I did today, that I went to church and that I did this, I did that. And so think about how do you spend your time? So I'm going to give you just a, something really practical. There's no slide for it because I think you'll be able to remember it. You know, think about what you do three times a day or supposed to. How many meals a day? Three. What? What are they? Breakfast and dinner. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Or different three times in the day, commune with God for a period of time, whatever it, whatever it may be. You know, we're quick. I know watching my kids, we're quick to shuffle the food in our mouth. Uh, either myself or more often Amor, and uh, she'll spend a lot more time cooking the meal, and the kids come in and devour it, and they can't wait to get out. And we got to force them to stay in. Say so three things, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In the morning when you wake up, uh, prayer is just a beautiful thing to do. You know, what we just read right now, it's very simple. What we just read now, uh, we had a prayer, and some of you may recognize that. Uh, guys, I'm going to pick on Bella and Forrest all the time this morning. So what prayer did we just read earlier? You do it every day in Mrs. Barrett's class, Right? Luther's morning prayer, right? He understood this. There's a morning prayer he wrote that he, does, he said, if you don't know how to pray, do this every single day. And it's just simply, I wake up in the morning, and I'm like, man, I can't wait to go. And you say a prayer to God and say, hey, help me tackle this day. And it's an inspiring kind of prayer. Maybe you kind of throw in there, throw in there a verse of the day from the YouVersion Bible app, but something that helps you just in two or three minute devotion, man, get you up in the morning and get you moving. That's in the morning, just like breakfast is supposed to do that. But what do we skip often in the morning? Breakfast, we skip it. That's the most, what, important meal of the day, people tell us. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's the most important meal of the day, and we skip it. This is the most important meal of the day, don't skip it. Because it gets you up and moving. It reminds you who you are and how you're going to tackle your day. And then somewhere along the day, whether it be lunchtime or somewhere in the middle, Find time for not just a two to three minute devotion, but actually doing, you know, five, five, 10, 15 minutes of actually reading the Bible. And you can do this at lunchtime. You know, my problem is that oftentimes I skip lunch. Is that good? Absolutely not. It's the stupidest thing. But I got stuff to do. I got busy. I've got things to do. It's like, no, just spend. 10 to 15 minutes reading the Bible. And we talk about your phones. Guess what? It has all sorts of stuff on it. I'm reading one now, a Bible plan to help me read through the entire Bible, through the entire year. Some of you have done those things before. And I've got a great one I'm looking at. I think it's great. It's only been like, when day, we're on this, what, day seven? Day, I'm on day seven. 
It's great, but it's like uh, the Bible project, and it's just a simple, if you're like, ah, I struggle with this, it's a great introduction to the Bible because it helps to describe, hmm, it shows you a video about all the customs of the ancient world and all these different things to help you piece things together because it doesn't make sense sometimes. And there's a lot of them out there like that, or just simply taking your Bible at home and saying, okay, I'm going to spend some time reading this because I'm communing with God. Because in this, this is God's word, a letter he's written. So when I'm reading, I am communing with God. So find some time in the day. Find some time in the day. And I know not all time is created equal. Some of you are not morning people. So don't read the Bible when you're, you're slugging through it. If you're a night owl, it might be a great time. If you're a person who dozes off at night while you're watching TV, don't make that your time, your quiet time to read the Bible. Because what happens? Not all time is created equal. So find those times where you can focus. And then the last thing, moment, we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And dinner could be dinner. It could be any time after dinner. Pray again. Because I think this is a step a lot of people skip. We pray in the morning, we might read the Bible, but we don't tie off the day. We don't do a very good job of that. Like I said, we fall asleep during whatever we're doing. But we take a moment to pray at the end of the day, and Luther also wrote an evening prayer. And I love it in the evening prayer, I don't have it for you right now, but you can go find it, Luther's evening prayer. It uses a, a couple words like this, forgive me for my sins. Like today in the morning, I'm going to go attack the world. In the evening, is man, I screwed it up. I messed up. I hurt these people. I didn't do this right. I didn't do this wrong. And I pray for forgiveness. And I reflect on the day. Lord, help me with that. Pray for forgiveness. And then what he says is then sleep well. Because your sins are forgiven. So just be able to reflect and get that off your chest. And God is able to talk to you in that moment, commune with you in that moment, and just say, hey, you're forgiven. This is going on. Da, 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 da. And then you can sleep well. And you can rest. So those three things. Those three things. And to breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You know, Do you remember to eat during the day? How many of you remember to eat during the day? Okay, you can remember to do this. If you can remember to eat, you can remember to do this. And just to hammer this home one more time, why it's so important, there's actual study and evidence of the benefits of Bible reading. Uh, a website called Lifeway Research. Lifeway has been in the area of Bible study and Bible engagement group for a long time. And just a couple of years ago, they did a study on the, engage, they, they did a survey of like 40,000 people in their engagement in the Bible. And what they found out was that if you engage in the Bible once a week, and that includes right now in church, if you, guess what it does? Nothing. Nothing. If you engage in the Bible twice a week, Guess what it does? Nothing. No life change. No transformation. No life change. So even if you're in a Bible study that doesn't require that you try to, you Bible study where you're supposed to read the Bible every day, but you try to cram it all in on one day, that's still how many days? One day. Nothing. Two times. Nothing. Guess how much the third day? Next to nothing. Fourth day, they saw a meteoric rise. You would think it would just be next to next to nothing. No, they said it just took off. It just took off. We're talking about four days a week. And this is what they found, was that when that happened, the effects spiked in an astounding way. Feeling lonely drops 30%. Here's things. 
Anger issues drop 32%. Bitterness in relationships drops 40%. Uh, how many of you, by just those top three, have had issues with that before? Loneliness, anger, bitterness. Alcoholism itself drops 57%. Sex outside of marriage drops 68%. Feeling stagnant spiritually drops 60%. Viewing pornography drops 61%. But then you look at this, sharing your faith jumps 200%. And then discipling others, meaning walking alongside someone, jumps 230%. Why? Because you're more confident about what you're talking about. Because you're actually communing with God. You can tell people about the person you eat lunch with that you eat dinner with, that you commune you with you every day. I can tell you all about my kids. I can tell you all about my wife. I can tell you some things about Tony. And they're good things, but I can tell you only some things. I can only tell you some things. But when you share and spend time, regular time with God, you can share it with other people. Remember, when you spend your time with God, you're dining, you're eating, you're communing. So how many times a day? Three times a day. When? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Morning, noon, night. Okay? We can remember those things. And uh, we're going to pray right now. Because consider this part right now. Morning. You still have noon and night. I could stand here for a while and we could turn into noon. But we're not going to do that. Morning, noon, and night.